Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation and I'm really excited for this uh, opportunity to do some kind of a talk that's just in a different venue. I think this is a lot of fun. Um, so I will share some science on these aromatic diamonds and I tacked on a few slides about teaching organic chemistry because I know that's a fun topic for everybody. Um, cool. Let's see if I can click through here. There we go. Um, I think it's just always nice to give a little bit of personal background. Um, so I am, well, my parents are from Beijing, China, but I was actually born in Germany because my dad was uh, trying to get a PhD there and accidentally had me along the way. Uh, we moved to San Diego when I was about two years old and I grew up in San Diego. I did uh, undergrad at UC Berkeley, so Berkeley, California, and I did research at this really nice building here. This is the Molecular Foundry. Um, so this overlooks the UC Berkeley campus down here and the bay, it's really, really nice. Um, I always like to say that this building is super cool because it's cantilevered, so it hangs out. So my lab uh, was hanging out over the air, essentially, and that's kind of interesting to think about when uh, you know that San Francisco area is just full of earthquakes, right? So somehow this is a very stable building. Um, for my graduate studies, I went to Northwestern University. I uh, did my PhD with, yes, a Sir, Sir Fraser Stoddard, so he wasn't a knight, knighted by the queen. And... For my undergrad research, I worked on these cool molecules here on the left. Uh, these are kind of interlocked molecules. So what you're looking at is two rings here, and they're interlocked together in a way where they're not covalently attached to each other. So they're kind of free to move around and rotate. Um, but because of these differently colored groups here, you can get all sorts of different states out of them. And then in grad school, I took that and tried to organize those into extended uh, frameworks. Well, now I work at McAllister College, which is a primarily undergraduate institution, so that's often abbreviated as PUI. Uh, that's located here on the United States map in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, St. Paul is the other half of the Twin Cities, if you've ever heard that term, and the other Twin City is Minneapolis. Um, so, and McAllister College is one of these small liberal arts colleges. Uh, we have about 2,100 undergraduate students. Uh, there are no graduate students at all. And this last point is kind of a shock to me, actually, I learned that 20% of our majors historically have gone on to become faculty at uh, in higher education. And I think that it's not something that I'm proud of in terms of saying all of our students become faculty, but more that uh, I'm proud of how our students are really into this idea of teaching others, asking scientific questions, and hopefully answering scientific questions. So my lab, uh, I'm, in, I'm an organic chemist by training, but I'm really interested in materials applications. And in addition to that, I'm, you know, I take a lot of pride in mentoring students who are going on to do bigger and better things than me. So you get a nice selection of pictures here, and we'll see some of their work coming up. Um, before I get into my research, I want to spend a little time just in some background examples of organic materials. Uh, organic molecules, people often wonder, well, you know, what are they useful for other than making pharmaceutical drugs? And it turns out that for materials, especially in electronics and optics, uh, there's a ton of applications that you might not even be thinking about. Um, so I'll give three of them here. Uh, this first slide here is on liquid crystal displays. So I'm sure everyone has seen displays like this one on the left here, right? Um, you see them in kind of older watches, all sorts of cheaper screens and things. Turns out that this dark color right here, this is from an organic molecule. And often it's something like the one on the right here. And it's actually pretty cool because this molecule itself is not too special. Uh, what's special is that when this molecule is kind of organized in the bulk state, so a lot of these molecules organized together, they are either going to be transparent or they're going to block light. And so that's what the middle figure here is trying to show you. Uh, there are different phases that this molecule can take on in which either the light can go through or the light can't. And so that's uh, dependent on the uh, polarization uh, related to applying um, a voltage here. And so that's how these screens work. Right? And that's why you need to have electricity to get these things to give you any sort of darkness that you can read. Um, another big area is in OLEDs. So I'm sure many people have seen this term OLED around. Uh, it turns out OLEDs, I think, are now the dominant screen technology that we use in our electronics. Uh, this is kind of a nice picture of a flexible one, which kind of points to an advantage of organic systems, which is that uh, you can really get nice, flexible materials out of them, unlike with metals, which you think of as being a little bit more um, brittle. The way these uh, OLEDs work is that these are molecules that are uh, able to be excited. So usually this is done through applying a voltage. And then when they're in their excited states, they want to try to relax down to their ground state. 
And in doing so, they will emit light. So the light emitting part of it. And so there's a lot of research into how to get the exact right color that you need. So you need red, green, and blue. Uh, it turns out they aren't equally easy to make because of the way that, um, well, the, all the kind of chemistry behind it all, and then also the way that the human eye perceives those colors. Uh, so these are just some examples right here. And I do want to point out that when we talk about organic materials, we don't necessarily mean an avoidance of metals. So for example, here, there's an iridium as part of this molecule. Um, sometimes people talk about organic materials as replacing metals and toxic things. And I think that's a little bit of an unfair characterization. Uh, organic molecules are offering something complementary, something different, right? So like with OLEDs, you get certain colors out, uh, you get better blacks and things like that. Um, a third big area is just in organic semiconductors uh, more broadly. And so I think of this as just uh, molecules or materials that can sometimes transfer current and sometimes not. Um, I'm showing you kind of on the left here, two different types. So on the very left, this is a P-type uh, transistor setup where the molecule uh, is transferring, a, or I guess, sorry, the in a p-time material, you have a hole that's being transferred. So you have kind of a, a uh, lack of an electron. And what that means from the molecule side of the things is that it's an electron-rich molecule that's willing to give up one electron to create uh, a so-called hole, which is shown here. In the middle, I have the n-type version. So that's the opposite. If you have something that gives up electrons, you need something else that accepts that electron. Um, so that's what's being shown with this green arrow in the middle. Uh, this electrode is introducing an electron into the material here. And this is an example of an organic molecule that would uh, serve that purpose. And so for many people, there's kind of a divide between thinking in the bulk state versus in a single molecule state. So if you are preferring to think about single molecules like I do, uh, what these relate to is that when you have a whole transferring material, what you want is something that is very electron rich and has a high, uh, highest occupied molecular orbital energy. So this level has to be high in energy in order for an electron to leave it. And then conversely, over here, we want a lowest unoccupied molecular orbital that's low in energy. So it's easier for electrons to go into it. If you combine all that together, then you can make fancier devices. So this is a schematic for a photovoltaic where this molecule, for example, um, has both elements of electron accepting nature and electron donating nature. So a molecule like this gets hit with light. Actually, those two things will separate. So you get kind of a whole electron pair and that generates current. And that's uh, kind of in a very simple way, the working principle uh, behind a photovoltaic. So you may or may not have noticed this, but in a number of the molecules that I've shown you, uh, there's this motif that I've highlighted in orange in these molecules on this slide. Uh, this functional group is called a cyclic imid. Uh, it conveys an electron accepting tendency to whatever it's attached to. Turns out it's a pretty prevalent functional group. So in these examples, these aren't, these aren't just materials. On the very left here is uh, the molecule thalamid. This is actually an industrial source of nitrogen. So this is used industrially on you know, massive, massive scale. Uh, the next molecule here is thalidomide, which is a little bit, I guess, more negative of a molecule that um, you know, had a lot of birth defect side effects. But it turns out it's, uh, I believe, under clinical trials currently now uh, for non-pregnant women to use for other types of um, things. In the middle here is prosimidone. This is an antifungal or uh, kind of anti or a pesticidal type of a molecule that's used. And then on the right, I have uh, three very important materials um, imid containing molecules. So the first big one here is perylene diamid, middle is napsylene diamid, last one is pyromyelitic diamid. Uh, these names derive from uh, the names for these central regions of these molecules here. And cyclic imids are really nice. Uh, I like them a lot because synthetically they're very, well, quote unquote, easy to do. Uh, conventionally, the way it's done is by reacting a primary amine and a cyclic anhydride. So you kind of already been set up with this ring right here. Uh, this ring is electrophilic. So it gets attacked by a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen here. And that results in a ring opening reaction to form intermediate that looks like this. This is called an amic acid. And this given a little bit of motivation with temperature or polar solvents can close down to make the actual image. The example that I've shown here in terms of the reaction is actually for a polymer synthesis, uh, specifically the polymer kapton. 
And I really like this example because uh, it turns out this gold foil here on this Apollo capsule uh, was held on to in part by this polymer. And so that tells you that this functional group, this setup is relatively stable, right? This molecule or this polymer uh, partially survived re-entry from space. Uh, for me, that's super cool. As an organic chemist, I expect things to melt and burn pretty easily, uh, but that's not the case here. I think for NASA, this was not ideal because the foil was not supposed to peel all the way off, but uh, I take that as a win. These aromatic thiamines are really cool molecules. They can be used to do all sorts of functions. Um, to me, what's mostly interesting is their ability to take in an electron. When they do that, they enter this radical anion state where the radical is referring to having an one unpaired electron and then there's an anion because of the negative charge of the electron uh, these molecules also do a lot of self-assembly so on the very right here um, this is an example of a perylene diamide uh, that stacks together in these really long infinite stacks and people are really interested in this uh, for looking at charge transport along this stack and if you kind of combine all that together, then you can make these, um, in the middle here, there's an organic photovoltaic where it's kind of small here, but you can see the napsylene diamide structure as a key component of this uh, particular example. And so where my lab comes into this is we do research into new aromatic diamond scaffolds. So I'd shown you those three you know, vertical ones before, and I'm really into these uh, different versions of those. And in the second area that I'm not going to talk about today, we also do a lot of work putting cations onto these electron acceptors. So if you think about something that's electron accepting already uh, and adding a positive charge to it, that's got to make it even more electron accepting. So um, a little bit grayed out here, but you can see that think weird things happen. But for today, we'll talk about uh, some of the new isomers that my group is researching. Um, so just to kind of hammer this point home, conventionally aromatic diamonds you see that are used industrially have always been kind of following this linear structure. They're very symmetric. And it's possible to make structures like these, so literally taking a new angle on it. Um, all we've done is really just uh, look at a different isomer. And it just turns out these have been understudied um, for probably synthetic reasons more than anything else. And so then if synthetic problems are the problem, well, that's where my um, work started off with my students. And so I'm presenting here just kind of a comparison of what you would do to synthesize pyromolytic diamide. Uh, this is done industrially, I think at, you know, 500-ish tons per year scale, maybe, maybe something a little bit bigger than that. Um, so this is the molecule durine. So this is a, a extract from petroleum and other types of mining. Uh, this gets oxidized up. And so this is produced a lot because it's needed as a polymer precursor. And so you can buy it from Aldrich for really cheap, 30 cents a gram. Um, and the, this you can convert into the diamide. So then you can imagine the analogous process happening for uh, the molecule that I'm targeting here. Um, I guess I should have defined that as melophanic diamide, which is MDI, abbreviated here. Um, so going all the way back in your synthesis, you would have to have this tetramethylbenzene where the four methyls are all next to each other. And you would go through kind of an oxidation and then that cyclization, et cetera. Uh, turns out that this starting material here is also a common constituent of petroleum, um, kind of crude oil and crude extracts from the earth. Uh, but there's no real industrial use for it. And so then because of that, this actually is actually really expensive. It's normally just burned as part of, I guess, fuel. Um, the stuff that's not used. So in some ways, then I know we're not supposed to be uh, promoting the use of petroleum. But on the other hand, if there's stuff that's just getting tossed away and not used, uh, it'd be nice to have a purpose for it. So uh, this is the synthetic idea. Um, there is some precedent for this uh, back in the literature here. And it works out okay. So from the literature, this top left quadrant is what was reported. 67% um, yield, we were able to rep reproduce that. Uh, for what I was envisioning, I was hoping to be able to do a lot more chemistry on this molecule. And so that required being able to put in halogens because that's an often uh, easy way to do further chemistry. So when you have a halogen, you can uh, substitute that. And then also because of solubility reasons, it's nice to be able to put in alkyl groups. And it turns out that when you do either of those things, the yields drop. So this is a nice little, if you go from this phenyl group to an hexyl group, your yield drops pretty significantly. Uh, if you keep the phenyl but add bromines, your yield drops. And then if you do both, it drops even more. Right? Um, 
And that's kind of strange. So this is not a generalizable method then. And so that's where we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to do. And it turns out that, you know, this middle route here, route A, is what I'd shown you. And this is the conventional thing to do to make the cyclic anhydride here and work with that. Uh, but turns out we can just avoid that. Uh, this was a total surprise. It took us a few years to really figure this out because the convention is so normal to go with the cyclic anhydride. Really, no one ever talks about doing these reactions starting with the uh, carboxylic acids right here. But it turns out you can do this either in the solid state, and that works pretty well. Or if you go to solution, you get a little bit more versatility, and we can get that conversion to go super nicely. Um, so this is kind of our, you know, proving that this does work for a variety of halogens, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, the most important ones for substitution. Uh, there's an interesting trend that we get out of this, which is that when there's no halogens, this is actually harder. So if you're starting with the tetra acid, but you don't have halogens here, uh, the reaction is worse. So it's kind of flipped from that initial literature uh, report. And so we were just kind of curious about why that is, is a very organic chemistry type of a question, like why? Right? And so we did some uh, DFT or density functional theory calculations, just to look at the energies of the various possible outcomes here. And so what you're seeing is that starting with a tetra acid, you can actually form two different types of imids. Uh, so you can either have the asymmetric looking uh, imid up here, where the two acids are on one side and the imids on the other, or you can kind of make the more symmetric looking molecule down here. Uh, of course, the upper one is what we would want if we're trying to get to our product, and the lower one is not. On the right is a plot of the relative energies of uh, these three molecules here. And if you look at it, it, uh, if you think about reactions, what we want is usually to go downhill, right? We want to go from where we start off on the very left here and go down in energy and find the lowest uh, energy place. That's kind of, um, I guess, general chemistry thinking right there. Uh, but it turns out that for this set of molecules, it's not the desired product that is actually the most stable uh, by these calculations. It's actually the, the half converted product. Uh, I think there's some amount of, you know, uh, steric repulsion here, maybe that's contributing to an increase in energy, maybe some hydrogen bonding that's being retained here. Um, but whatever the case is, when it's just the hydrogens, so X equals H, uh, it's pretty clearly favoring this intermediate. Uh, whereas when you go to having chlorines, it's much more even. And so you're much more uh, likely to go towards the product, or at least your distribution has more product, uh, desired product in it. Um, we were able to slow this down, so using a really sterically bulky amine, so this R group with, a, I guess the amine would have a nitrogen here. Uh, when we do the reaction there, we can track this reaction by NMR. So this, if you look at it, uh, is an NMR tube reaction running for, what, it's 755 hours. That's a lot of days. Um, I think we, at some point, this was over the summer where everyone went home, and then there was a gap where there was no one in the lab. So this is why there's a nice gap here. Um, but we can see what's happening. So on the very top, this is the uh, product the desired product dissolved in the solvent, acetic acid. Uh, this is the tetracarboxylic acid by itself. And then as soon as you add in the amine and start doing the reaction, you can see the changes happening here. And so what we're seeing is an, a subset of the signals uh, looking just at these two hydrogens out here in um, all of these molecules. And we can track it, and eventually it reaches this equilibrium, about one to one to one mixture of products. And this matches nicely uh, with the computational data saying that this is not by far the most stable thing, and often this is a little more preferred. Um, we're able to increase our yields a bit if we use microwave reactor conditions. Um, so with a microwave reactor, you it's just like a home microwave. You can heat a lot harder. You can heat a lot higher in temperature, and you can get your yields to be a little bit better, and that works for really bulky amines as well. Um, so that was kind of just being able to just being able to make the diimid itself. Uh, from there, we were really interested in converting these into more interesting molecules. Um, our initial attempts were a little bit unsuccessful. So this type of chemistry is totally precedented by many other reports of people working with uh, aromatic diimids. But for us, it just didn't work that well. Um, it was okay for the top one, but once you have the sulfur nucleophile or the oxygen nucleophile, uh, you'll start to drop. And what we're getting is a lot of competitive uh, reactions at the cyclic imids, actually breaking them open. Um, so something about organizing the imids this way uh, leads to just more unwanted reactions. 
So uh, we had a lot of trouble with that and trying to figure all that out. But one day, a student tried to use this molecule as a base in their reaction. Um, so this was Stella down here. And uh, to organic chemists, this is familiar as DBU. And so we were able to isolate totally unexpected product that looks like this on the right here. Uh, this NMR, I'm not going to go through how to assign all of it, but it matches with this product over here. And what's happened is DBU is actually itself reacted. The base, which we don't expect to react with our molecule MDI, uh, the DBU has reacted with the MDI and done an annulation to form this five-membered ring in the middle. Uh, two people who kind of think back to organic chemistry, uh, this is somewhat of an unexpected outcome because in sophomore organic chemistry, you're probably taught that DBU is a sterically hindered base that is not a nucleophile, so it should not react like we're seeing here. Um, so organic chemistry always has little surprises for us. And turns out this is not a brand new reaction. There is a literature precedent for it, so it's nice to know that we weren't um, totally crazy for seeing this happen. Uh, but when you have this ortho dichloro setup, it is possible to get that annulation to happen. But looking at this, what we took away from it is that you know, if you have a molecule where it can attach at two different points at these two sites over here, maybe that's a better setup, right? You already have the two chlorines here. You take a molecule that has two nucleophilic sites in there at once. Maybe that just matches up better and uh, might work a little better. It turns out that hypothesis was right. And so even though we're dealing with sulfurs and oxygen still here with these Y and Z positions, we can get really high yields just by making sure that they are... Um, attached onto dinucleophiles rather than mononucleophiles. Um, so it's really nice to be able to get this series, um, get kind of this um, trend of molecules here. What's really cool is that commercially available are these tetra-substituted benzenes, and then you can start to really string rings together in a row. The reason that's important is because the more pi bonds and lone pairs you can have conjugated together, um, the uh, more in the visible range your molecules start to interact with light. And so I have these colored according to the color that the solids are. And uh, the more colorful the solids are, the happier the students are. So uh, making this top one here nice and purple, uh, bottom one here really, really vibrant red. And both of these go in really nice yields. So you can oxidize these. Uh, so I'm showing just two possible uh, compounds on the left here. I'm calling these heteroacenes, where acenes is referring to this linear sequence of rings. Um, when you oxidize, what you do is you end up removing a molecule of H2, essentially, and uh, kind of increasing the amount of conjugation going through the uh, backbone here. Once you get to this heteroacene structure, uh, these become really, really good electron acceptors. Um, so if, uh, for those of you familiar with electrochemistry, which is what's going on on the right here, um, these are showing you kind of where in voltage electrons are being transferred to and from the molecule. So if we're talking about electron acceptors, we want these peaks to be more and more um, to the right or closer to zero if we're going from negative towards zero. And so if you look at the oxidized versions, they have these processes going way closer to zero than the analogous ones over here. Uh, you might be a little bit confused. Well, there's waves on the other side over here. It turns out these uh, are because of oxidation processes. So these are on the flip side of electrons being removed. Uh, this all kind of makes sense because on the left, we have electron richer center. On the right, this is the electron acceptor. Um, we're excited especially about this ox NSSN uh, compound here because the voltages that it's accepting electrons are about at the level where uh, you need things to be to deal with uh, air-stable organic electronic devices. So this will be an excellent candidate for us to uh, look at in a more of a device setting. Turns out that some of these molecules are also really, really strong uh, fluorescent emitters. And so particularly uh, this combination right here, if you have this diaminohydroquinone as your tetra substituted nucleophile, after an oxidation, you get to this final product, and this has quantum yield of 71%, um, uh, about 583 nanometers. So for uh, people interested in kind of the more OLED type of research, these are pretty decent values. The color is not quite a pure red, green, or blue, um, but just knowing that this setup of having all these images around this type of a core is really nice for taking the next step. Um, 
I have kind of a funny story here. So he submitted some of this work for review. And then uh, it turns out one of the reviewers actually sent me an email and was like, oh, these are really cool molecules. Would you like to collaborate? And, you know, whenever someone has to collaborate, that's a good deal for everybody. And so we sent some of these molecules off to um, Professor Uwe Banz's group in Heidelberg in Germany. And so he's kind of the uh, acing big guy in um, the field. And so they have a ton of these diamines that look like this. And so it was really easy for them to convert a lot of them into aza acines. So now, instead of heteroacines, I'm calling these aza acines because uh, there's only nitrogens in this central linear region. And so this is just one example. Uh, but this molecule here is super cool because it absorbs light at 908 nanometers. So this is way outside the visible uh, region of light. Um, so this is something that we can't even see. Um, near, our, near IR light is super important because there's a lot of um, kind of the sun's energy coming out at the near IR wavelengths that isn't captured by a lot of molecules. And also by, uh, for kind of more human health type of applications, it turns out that our skin is really good at absorbing visible light, but not so good at absorbing near IR light. And so if you want to image underneath skin, it's important to have things that absorb light outside the visual region. And so a molecule like this might fall into that category. Um, on the right here, I again show this uh, EA or electron affinity, and this value is, again, at this value where this is a great electron acceptor that would fall into an ambient stable um, category, and we're looking at devices with these now. Yeah, so I guess I just said that, but we do have these ongoing research directions. Um, uh, the BUNS group is looking at these in thin film, specifically in field effect transistors, um, just to see if they are good n-type materials or not. Um, we've also got some work looking at these as supramolecular charge transfer materials. Uh, so these diimids are electron accepting and they interact with electron rich molecules. Uh, if you mix, if you just physically mix these two things together and grind them with a mortar and pestle, you get this, you go from two colorless uh, powders to this really vibrant red. So um, kind of fun. We're getting all sorts of interesting properties out of that. And then finally, for the organic chemistry side, we've been looking at how to synthesize these molecules with no heteroatoms, no nitrogens, no sulfurs, no oxygens uh, in the backbone. Um, doing this is um, nice because without the nitrogens in there, you get a kind of a differently tuned set of properties uh, because you lose the electronegativity of the nitrogen. And uh, we're interested to see how the imids affect all of that. Cool. So I'm going to shift gears now to my little teaching blurb right here. Um, cause I, you know, at McAllister college, we're a small college and we do value teaching a lot and that's part of why I'm there. Um, so I've got this problem on the screen here. So for a few years, I felt like, you know, students would often come to me with this, I guess, complaint or concern, uh, that practice problems weren't matching up with problem sets and exams that I was writing. And, you know, I was thinking about, it, I was like, yeah, like I write my exams, I go to the literature, I find cool things, uh, for problem sets and exams. And that's what I do. And then students are looking at, well, they're looking at their textbooks and then they're looking at YouTube. That's kind of my generalization of what's going on. And in both of those cases, they're not really seeing the literature aspect of what I am using to assess the students. And I think these memes pretty accurately describe how the students feel. And I think it's fair that they feel that way. Um, and this is not an uncommon problem, right? Um, you know, the professor's practice questions are a certain way and then the exam is nothing like that. Right, um, let alone what the student can remember or not. And I think that's an important thing, right? It's one thing to say students should be able to push themselves a little further on the exam. And it's a little bit different to be like, well, it's just not the same. It's not presented the same way. And then I think another thing that happens with students is that their practice work then becomes, it feels less important and more futile if they f go into it thinking that it's not going to be relevant to the problem set or the exam. And so what I did is I spent a bit of time and I created this website. So uh, for anyone who does organic chemistry, please um, use this and give me feedback. Uh, realorganicchemistry.org. Uh, this is a database of just a variety of different organic reaction examples. And I pulled all of these from the literature. So they, um, every single reaction that I have in this, um, all these links here, uh, they are all directly from real scientific articles. And so I think that's really nice for students. They don't, you know, I have the citation for every single practice problem here. No student is going to go and pull up, well, maybe not no student, but very few students would ever go and pull up 
uh, one of these articles and read it, but just even knowing that this is a real reaction and has some relevance to real life, uh, I think is helpful for students. Um, so this is the website. Uh, you can tell that this is like a 90s website. Um, I learned HTML back in the 90s, and that's my extent of web page making skills. So that's what I made here. Uh, this is displaying a PDF. And yeah, so there's also answer keys that you can click through. Um, just to give you an idea of kind of the range of things, I think it's important that we show students that there's things in the scientific literature that are really simple looking. So simple molecules, just like you might actually see in a textbook. And that there are also complex molecules that you might expect on an exam. Right? And I think just helping students see that the literature and real life and exams are connected to these sim quote unquote simpler practice problems is important. So um, that was kind of the goal. There's about 300 or so reactions up there. Um, so more than enough for any student to go through for a couple semesters. Another cool thing that I've been doing is I've been having students actually help me add to this database. And so the way that I do this is I uh, created a series of literature assignments where I ask students to go to the latest issue of an organic chemistry journal. And I ask them, you know, you don't need to read the article, understand the experiments and tell me the conclusions and all of that. What I want you to do is to just Take what you've learned in class. You recognize organic molecules and reactions. Can you find a reaction that we've learned about in class that you think is a good example? And in doing that, I've been really uh, pleased because then you know, they surprise me. They're not always picking these really simple things. They do pick inter interesting reactions, but at the same time, they are reactions that are relevant for an introductory student. Um, it's really been really nice to uh, hand out material where I've been able to cite that you know a former student is the one who found this problem in the literature. And it's just got this kind of nice snowball effect of, you know, everyone knows this student, that's so cool. Uh, this is a real reaction. Oh, like this student could do it, now I can do it next. Anyway, uh, I've been really enjoying this whole um, setup. And so this is my little pat myself on the back here. Um, so we've gotten good feedback from McAllister students. Um, I was really excited to get this email just out of the blue from a graduate student actually, who's been recommending this site to um, their undergrad so um, I guess you know it's nice that something that one makes kind of gets out there and is useful and then maybe the best of all from the perspective of a professor uh, I had someone tell me that they used one of the reactions on their final exam so um, small pat on the back but cool all right and I just want to end and say that you know I showed you a little bit of science um, and none of that science would have been possible without an amazing group of students, uh, many of whom are alumni now. I'm at a career stage where um, I think my very first potential PhD will be happening very soon. So Dan is in the process of writing up a thesis. Uh, but it's such a rewarding part of this job just to see students um, do the science and get all this done. Um, finally, I also should thank the funders, so the National Science Foundation Research Corporation, and oh, I guess, and also my collaborators, um, and also all of you for listening. Um, I welcome emails. I should have thrown up a Twitter handle here too, and I'm super excited to see what questions have come up so far. All right, awesome. I, I will go ahead and tell you now that the the website was a big hit. Uh, <laughs> we got somebody in chat <laughs> saying that they are going to definitely recommend this to students that they mentor in the future. So, awesome. kudos again. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's jump straight into the questions. Um, so. Uh, so this was, I think, talk, just the, the initial uh, diameter, uh, diameter reaction that you guys are working on. Um, and somebody asking, is the reaction light sensitive? Oh, yeah. So we haven't had any issues with light, um, with kind of the diameter syntheses. Mm -hmm. Some of the later molecules that we make from there, um, we do get some, in certain, especially when we're dealing with the ions that I didn't talk about today, we get actually um, some photosensitivity. Uh, photo reductions that happen. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, are there so you, when you talked about the the hydrogen um, terminated, I guess diamonds. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there and you mentioned and you talked about how you know the the yields when you try to do the reaction with them are, are generally pretty poor. Um, are there any possible ways to overcome those, that issue? Like, could you go to a higher reaction temperature, or is there a different method you could try, or something like that? Or is yeah, it so I think kind of like it's just it's just not really going to work well. 
Yeah, that's a interesting question. So, well, I guess one thing is at least for this combination right here, we could go back to the very original 2002 literature report where they did do that cyclic intermediate. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be at least for that particular combination would be okay. okay. Um, and then let's see, do I have my uh, so for the microwave reaction here? So this left column, I didn't really highlight this, but under microwave conditions with a lot of heating and a lot of time, you do okay. at least get it to go faster and then, um, or yeah, faster. And then the yield does go up a bit. Um, okay. yeah. All right. So, so there, there may be some options that haven't really been looked at. Right. Okay. A little more energy intensive. Yeah. Got you. Uh, okay. So this one's, this one's from a chemist. So you, and you'll be able to tell very <laughs> quickly, <laughs> uh, when expanding the scope and aromatic function, has there been any investigation into naph- naphthal or similar polyaromatics connecting the diamonds. I, I think you, you kind of yeah. So so we have this. So you're, I think the question would be asking like this molecule, but with naphthalene in the instead. Mm-hmm. So just two rings here. If that's the question, then we do have that. We've been able to make it. Um, we're in the process of characterizing it now. Uh, we had to do some other synthetic tricks to get there because. Uh, well, there's no nitrogens or sulfurs or oxygen, so we couldn't do kind of the normal substitution reaction here. Okay. Okay, uh, Blaine, I guess you, you can confirm if that's if that's kind of what you were asking about. Uh, let's see. For okay, <laughs> this is this is I'll, I'll go ahead and ask this one. You you kind of touched on it with the the second reaction, the the one that's in the middle of the screen here. Um, for poor, poorly soluble systems, has mechanochemistry been considered as a synthetic tool? Yeah, I. We, I've thought about it before because I know that um, in reactions like this one, um, people have done these with mechanochemistry. Uh, we haven't tried it ourselves. Um, I, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah uh, go, I, I don't have a ball mill. That's kind of the more bigger limitation. Sure. Yeah. So, so you kind of did it with the, the, the screen that you were just on that had... Um, Whoops. Yeah. The, so the, the middle one there, yeah, that middle reaction where you right. described grinding it together. You, but yeah. I had to start laughing when you said that because the question had just been asked about mechanical. Oh, funny. And you're like, hey, yeah, we grind this together. And it, you know, mm, it's like, yeah. there we go. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Okay. So for the the uh, or the molecules that you showed, the, they, were, they were NN and NSSN. And then you talked about yep. uh, oxidizing them and you showed the electrochemistry. So first of all, thank you. I, I do electrochemistry for my work. So that made me really happy. Um, <laughs> something that I actually understand pretty well. Um, could you, do you think you could electrochemically oxidize the starting, uh, the, the NN and the NSSN molecules um, and maybe get, well, I guess the top one, you, you pretty much get a complete conversion to the oxidized form, but maybe that right. bottom one where you don't get the 100%, you know, could, could you do an electrochemical oxidation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, I've never, we've never tried it like on a synthetic scale, but I've been thinking about adding um, electrosynthesis capability to my lab. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know uh, if people have seen, but now there's kind of high throughput, so you can do like 24 reactions at once. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think this that could be a very valuable tool. And actually, I've been thinking a little bit about using that even in kind of the previous steps. Because um, mm-hmm. I didn't really talk about the chemistry of these steps, but uh, it's possible that if you use electrochemistry to do it, this might actually be a pretty easy substitution reaction. Like it might be a radical electrochemical uh, possible reaction anyway. So interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. We've got one last question. So if anybody has any further ones, go ahead and get them in. Um, is it possible to create artificial photo photo centers? Uh, Thank you. The, the uh, person asked if this is thinking, in like a photosynthesis type of context, so like light capture for energy, things like that. Yeah, I think it would be. Um, it takes you know a little bit more on the um, material side of things, but these molecules certainly are the right. Um, they absorb light at the right wavelengths. They absorb them at the right absorptivity, so they're very highly absorbing. Um, so they have all kind of the so they have the right properties for that type of application. Okay. Uh, I think that may be all the questions we have. Um, so if there's nothing, no further questions, um, I'll go ahead and start wrapping up and say, first of all, thank you to uh, Dr. Cal. Uh, that was a really cool talk. You covered a lot of really interesting work. Um, 
and and I, I definitely learned a lot. I still have a lot of chemistry left to learn, but <laughs> this was this was really really entertaining and very informative. So thank you for that. Um, thank you to everybody for coming out. Uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, that, that's pretty much what I've got. Is there any anything further you'd like to say? No, this was just super cool. It's really nice to interact with people this way. Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad, I, I'm glad it was a good time. Um, if I could get you to hang around for just one second, I will talk very briefly. Um, for everybody else, uh, thanks for coming out. We'll see you uh, next week. Um, we have uh, Clayton Hale from the University of Georgia. So, same time, same place. And uh, be safe. Get, get boosted. Um, and. <laughs> Stay warm, I hope, <laughs> depending on where you are. We're, we're, uh, we're in the 70s here, but you know, if it's cold where you are, please stay warm. And um, I'll see you all next time. Thanks for coming out. Thanks, everyone.